Okay, hi everyone, welcome, welcome to everyone here. It's fantastic to see you all um, here at the User Testing Europe headquarters, and it's fantastic to see so many familiar faces and obviously a few new ones too. Um, so quickly before I hand over to the main event, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anna, I'm the head of comms and PR here at Startup Grind, um, and I'm your wonderful MC tonight, uh, fortunately, unfortunately. Um, so before we get started, um, a quick shout out to Nick Freer, um, who's here in the audience um, for the original introduction to Andy. Um, yeah, we visited Andy at the user testing headquarters back in April. Um, and it was, yeah, I know that we're in for a massive treat tonight because, yeah, what a fantastic event. Um, so firstly, um, also um, a shout out to those of you watching from home. Um, and to Tom Drescher in particular, um, who's watching from Fra Frankfurt, which is pretty cool. Um, so we couldn't have thought of a better venue to host this event this evening um, here in User Testing's Europe HQ, uh, amidst the news of the Scottish Government's generous and critical support of the tech sector um, through the tech scaler hubs and of course in the custodianship of Codebase, um, support from international companies such as User Testing here in Scotland um, are a massive benefit to our local ecosystem. Um, and also, as you all know, um, our, our team volunteers our time in the pursuit of trying to make a meaningful contribution to that ecosystem in whatever way we can. Um, so yeah, having the support of Andy, the user testing team, um, and of course, all of you guys here tonight um, is like, just hugely appreciated. Um, a little bit about Startup Grant. Um, so we exist to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs all over the world. And it is truly a global um, community. Um, we have over 540 chapters in 200, 125 countries worldwide. Yes, a truly, truly a global community of founders and entrepreneurs. Um, and our values help others give first and make friends. And we truly live by these values. Um, it's all about the people and it's all about those friendships and relationships that we can all make here um, with, you know, to propel our businesses. Um, and our sponsors um, are the wonderful CMS and Firstport, um, who we thoroughly, uh, you should definitely get in touch with them. Um, and our wonderful partners, Welcome, AAI and DM Nutrition, and of course, Swerf. And um, as I said earlier, a huge thank you to Emily for providing the wonderful food this evening. Um, so all of Emily's delicious meals are uh, made from food um, from ingredients that would have otherwise uh, gone to the landfill. So not only does she make incredible food, but also um, reducing food waste, which we think is br fantastic. Brilliant. And finally, before I hand over to Nick, um, I'll be back at the end of the evening to host the Q&A. Um, so please head over to slido.com and you can enter the code, which is up on the screen at the moment and will remain on the screen. Um, and you can submit your questions there and also upvote questions that you think might be particularly interesting. Brilliant. Okay, the floor is yours. Over to you, Nick and Andy. Thanks so much, Anna. I yeah, I need that. <laughs> um, just make sure your mic is on, Andy. Test. Beautiful. Um, was that a user testing joke there straight off the bat? See? See? <laughs> It's going to be a long night. Um, Andy, thank you so much for your time again. Thanks I, for having me. I'll do the gags if it's yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> was I supposed to be the straight man or was that you? Which one of us? We didn't okay, have time got to it. get through it. Got it. Uh, if these beers go down, well, neither of us will be straight by the end of it. Um, so yeah, so thanks again for your time. We managed to accost you on one of your, your trips to Scotland, but as Anna mentioned, we were originally introduced to you by Nick Freer when we had the pleasure to take 20 entrepreneurs out to Silicon Valley and you generously hosted us at the, the San Francisco HQ of uh, user testing. And at that time, it was just as the curtains of COVID were kind of opening up again. And I understand it was a bit of a novelty to have people in the building there. It was entirely empty, but it was awesome. We hadn't quite welcomed even all of our employees back into the office. And the opportunity came up to host you all. And uh, our team in the office was like, great, let's, let's give it a run. Like, let's have some people into the office. So you all were really our first visitors in the office. And... Uh, it was really fun, but it was a bit of an interesting dynamic. It sort of felt like 
when you'd show up in the office on a weekend and no one's there, but you're in an office. That was sort of the vibe when you guys came in the door, but then it got it got rowdy and fun and we had a good time. So it was it was great. It did, yeah. If you're looking for, I was going to say, if you're looking for a good time in San Francisco, but let's not <laughs> <laughs> let's not go down there. But the the user testing HQ is a fantastic place, much like here. And, and shout out to Sam for making this happen. The snacks here are great. The drinks in the HQ are fantastic. We're very happy to have happy hour here uh, there. Um, but look, okay, let's get cut cut to the chase. For people that don't know about user testing, could you just give us a little overview of the company, its origin, its founding story, its purpose? It's growth. Sure, yeah, I, it's a, it, I'm not the founder to start with. I know a lot of you that work with Startup Grinder, founders and starting companies, and I think being a founder is a really special thing to do, so I try to be really upfront. Like, not a company I founded, it's a company uh, that I worked with the founder to come on board uh, and help kind of drive through another phase of growth. It's a really fascinating, but I think kind of basic and core idea, which is how do you get real feedback from real people going through an experience that you're building? And you know, I tell folks all the time, I think the best ideas are obvious in retrospect. And I, you know, I should have started Facebook or I should have started Dropbox. I worked in the content management industry for 10 years and didn't start Dropbox or Box. But it's an obvious idea in retrospect. That's sort of user testing. When folks see this idea of using a software product to go in and say, hey, I'd like 10 people from you know, this kind of background, this kind of interest, to just use my product and use the, the kind of tech we're all familiar with. I mean, we record ourselves all the time right? and record our screens and share our thoughts. And so we basically help people collect that kind of feedback very quickly so that if you're building something, you can say, what's it like to be a user who's not me going through this product and going through this experience? Uh, the company was started uh, 15 years ago. So, uh, you know, startups can take a little while to sort of get to product market fit and scale. Uh, the original idea came about when our founders, Daryl and Dave, were working on uh, sort of a Web 1.0 project they had 15 years ago. And what they found was they were constantly going across the street to the grocery store and finding people, as Dave would describe it, stuck in line with their groceries on the conveyor belt. So they can't go anywhere. They're checking out. And they would start asking them questions with printouts of their website. Which one of these do you like better? Why do you like it better? Which one would you use? What would you think about this? And they found that feedback to be so valuable. They said, there's got to be a better way to get that kind of feedback. And like a lot of startup stories, it sort of turned into a pivot. Like instead of building the site they were building, they solved the problem they needed solved to build the website they were building. And so that was sort of the early days of user testing. The company started as a pay-as-you-go website. So back in the day, as they say, you would pay $20 to go to usertesting.com, and one person who was simply not your mom or your partner or your best friend would use the thing that you had built and tell you what they liked or didn't like about it. Um, the, the company evolved that way for about four or five years, uh, building up an audience of people giving feedback, an audience of people looking for feedback, and then sort of got pulled into being an enterprise software product. A uh, VP at a large tech company called up one day and called Daryl and said, um, we love your site. We use it all the time. I have end of quarter budget. I would like to buy $40,000 worth of videos. Now they're $20 a piece at this point. And Daryl being a very good entrepreneur says, absolutely, we have an enterprise plan. It's $40,000. <laughs> and the plan is you can use this as much as you would like. And that was essentially what was the initial user testing enterprise offering. Uh, and that just took off. What we found was companies were connecting this into how they built things and doing it at scale. And so now the business is, um, you know, we're, we're a publicly traded software company. It's entirely sold as enterprise software. Uh, we have companies that spend three, four, five million dollars a year with us testing all the products that you use every day. Uh, mostly digital products, you know, websites, mobile apps, but we do have customers that test physical products where they'll use the camera phone to get feedback from folks. So that's a, maybe a quick that's great. harbor cruise of, of user testing. Yeah, and um, you know, I'd love to talk about, about your leadership journey because this is not your first rodeo. You were previously at Salesforce and Oracle and a couple of big companies and you've got a background as a developer, correct? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you... I'm a pretty mediocre developer. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a bit of a techie. I started my career as a Java developer, but um, very quickly found that I thought the problem of why did the thing we were building win or lose the deal we were working on was also quite interesting and uh, shifted from doing software development to doing an MBA at the University of Edinburgh, which was my uh, first 
introduction of spending a meaningful amount of time in Scotland. So my wife and I lived here for a year while I did that. Uh, and ultimately ended up in product management. So I came up through the product management ranks, uh, first at a company called Stellant, which was acquired by Oracle. I spent five years at Oracle, went over to Salesforce, uh, and then was uh, a CEO at a company called Acton Software, which was a little bit of a turnaround. You know, your first CEO job's not the, not the easiest one. So it was a company burning a lot of cash and, and kind of hadn't found product market fit as much as we'd like and spent some time getting that going and then, uh, then came over here. How do you think, if at all, that developer background and then that career trajectory helped to shape the leadership style that you brought in for the founders here at UT in terms of structure, processes, and culture? That's a good question. I don't know about the culture side of it as much because I was in a very different industry when I was a developer. I was working at EDS, which is a um, software services provider on the General Motors account in Detroit. So I'm not exactly sure that gave off like the the tech vibe, we didn't have the snacks or the beer, like it was, it was a little different. Uh, you had to wear a suit every day. Um, but I would say, uh, I think one of the things you learn as a developer is, is how to isolate problems. You spend a lot of time, at least if you write the kind of code I wrote, you spend a lot of time troubleshooting. And the way you troubleshoot the bad code that you wrote is trying to isolate what's not working. And so I think you learn a lot about problem solving. I thought that was um, really important and valuable. And then I would say one of the other maybe slightly more engineering tendencies I have is I'm a very big believer in the theory of constraints. Um, I get asked, you know, as a exact, like, what's your favorite business book? And I think people are surprised when I tell them it's a book from the late 80s about manufacturing called The Goal, which is sort of weirdly written as a novel, but it's a great book and it's all about theory of constraints. And I think that's sort of a, a little bit of an engineering mindset of when you're running something there are always lots of problems, but ultimately there's a biggest problem. And how do you spend your time on the biggest problem? Because that's where you're going to get the most leverage. And I can testify to your problem solving skills because just before we got on stage, I said, oh, you've got a beer. Oh, we don't have a table. And you looked around the room and you said, well, let's just take one of those stools up and put it in between you. And I thought, this guy, he's, he's going to go far. Theory of constraints. Nick has two hands and three things. Let's find a table. <laughs> yeah, blew my mind. Uh, probably says more about me than you. Um, so you weren't the founder. You mentioned that. How do you think that dynamic played out for you to be able to come on here? Uh, you know, was it, founders are very emotional. They work 24-7 on their businesses. What do you think that was like for you in terms of, was it a blessing or a curse to come in and look at it objectively and help it to scale? I think every situation's unique uh, in any role that you join. It doesn't have to be coming in as a CEO with a founder. You're joining a team. There's a, there's a dynamic and there's people involved. I think in this situation, it was quite interesting in that um, Daryl and Dave didn't set out to start an enterprise software company. Uh, again, the company wasn't in enterprise software for the first six or seven years it existed. And it sort of became an enterprise software company. And when you move from being kind of a pay-as-you-go website product to an enterprise software company, you start having marketing teams and demand gen and salespeople and, it's, you know, and you're buying Salesforce and things like that. And I think Daryl just one day sort of said, this isn't like, I don't know how to do this. And it's not his fault. He, he didn't, you know, fail at what he was doing. He just sort of ended up in a place where it wasn't something he had background in. And I've, I've used the example before. It would be like hiring me to come run a restaurant. I've been in lots of restaurants. I'm a reasonably smart person. But if you told me go into this restaurant and run it, like people who work in restaurants would show up at my restaurant and be like, that's a weird way to do that. Like, you know, everybody else does this a different way. And I would say, well, I don't know that. I've never worked at a restaurant before. And that was sort of where user testing was at. We had this incredible product market fit, great culture, really nice people in the business. Customers loved the product. But if you sort of like pulled back a little bit into the business, it was like all of the things you're doing make sense, but that's not the way everyone else necessarily does it. And, you know, Daryl said, maybe we can bring in some people who have, who have done this before. And so when I talk to founders about this, my point isn't that you know your job is to replace yourself and hire a professional CEO. I don't think that's what most founders are setting out to do. I think it's the idea rather of saying, as you go about your journey, you're going to find all kinds of things along the way where it's not just about being a smart problem solver. Your business isn't about you coming up with a unique way to solve every single problem. Right? At user testing, we don't get up in the morning and say, like, I wonder if we can invent a different way to do accounts receivables. Like that's not, that's not a goal. So we should have people in the company that are really good at doing that and have done it other places and know how to do that. And so I think that's a, maybe the, the overall learning would just be, think about which things you want to be as a core competency and be different and focused on. Again, kind of theory of constraints, spend your time on those things. And in other areas, just sort of do it the way everybody else does it. And if you don't know how everybody else does it, like 
hire someone who knows how to do it like how everyone else does it. And that was sort of a little bit what Daryl ultimately got to. Like, this is a pretty big you know, pivot in the business. Does he want to spend two to three years learning how to be an enterprise software CEO? He's a very smart man. I'm sure he could have done that. Uh, he's a bit older than me at sort of a different point in his career. And he sort of said, I don't want to go learn how to do that. I'd rather find somebody who's done that and bring them on board. It's, um, it's interesting because it's one of the things... Uh, Anna mentioned that you know the Scottish government have put this massive amount of resource and responsibility into the hands of Codebase rather than traditional business support organisations now. And one of the things they're looking at is how can we take that global mindset and global playbooks from organisations that have done it before and bring it into Scotland. And you know, with a relatively small country with a small population, we've not got that many unicorns, so we don't have any local playbooks. And then obviously in Silicon Valley, you've got people who are in these massive corporates and they're learning every day. They've got a crash course kind of MBA on, uh, on scaling. And I think it's a very exciting kind of point for Scotland where we now have the resource to bring in those learnings. And of course, everyone's familiar with Zoom and learning online and people are sick to death of doing that kind of stuff. But we've, we've got that point of view as, right, we might not be able to get a coffee with with an Andy McMillan who's scaled the company and, and, and exit on an IPO when we'll get to that. But why would Scotland not be looking to the world for these kind of things? We've got it on our, we've got it on our doorstep. The knowledge is there. And I, I often feel like as a country, we, we sometimes struggle to think big picture stuff. That was the big thing that we had when we took those people out there. And your talk that we had out there was a massive part of this mindset shift to what really is possible. I don't have a question about that. I just want no, to say. No, I, I think it's right. I think it's 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 not only thinking big; it's thinking big about who could be in that network, who could help you out along the way. And I think what you'll find is um, whether it's you know reaching out you know to people that are in a different part of the world, but you know even here in Scotland, I think there's a lot of folks that you may not realize or even hear as you think about the network. I mean, I I was chatting earlier today with someone who lives in Sterling and is the CRO of a large PE backed company that does about two hundred million dollars a year in revenue here in Scotland. Um, there are a lot of people around that have done this at substantial scale. And I think one of the advantages in being in a small community like this is my biggest takeaway when I first came over here and talked about putting an office here was how much people wanted that to succeed. Every single person I met with from the Scottish government, from SDI, from the University of Edinburgh, I went out to CodeClan, I went to Codebase, and every single person was like, how can I help you make this happen? And so take advantage of that and think about the network that's here. People are anxious to support you. And so I think just figuring out how to connect all those dots. And there are a lot of people that have scaled things and, and are here. I think, I mean, to hear that from someone who's kind of come in and is learning about the Scottish ecosystem, that's really good to hear. I often talk about how our USP is we can help you find the right person really quickly. In somewhere like London, you'd have like six or seven steps. There's one degree of separation here. We'll get you in front of that person. And if you're cool and you come right, then you're going to get that empathy, that help, right? Yeah, and those folks have networks too, right? So it's not always just that that person, but it is sort of thinking about how do I how do I learn how to solve this problem? And part of that is realizing, as much as it's hard to admit, the problem you're trying to solve maybe isn't that unique. I think that's one of the really hard things to grasp if you're sort of really, I, I find problems interesting. I love to be, part of what I like about my job is every hour tends to be some other quite random problem that has now bubbled up to the CEO. So like you start with like, oh, there's a, you know, there's a finance thing we're talking about. And I do that for an hour and then you go to the next meeting and it's a product meeting and then you go to the next meeting and it's about a sales territory somewhere and you're sort of on this, you know, kind of journey of all kinds of things. And I find all of those to be interesting. But what I find myself kind of reminding myself all the time is like, maybe somebody has solved this before. Maybe somebody else has thought about how to organize territories for a sales team or solve this finance problem. And so that's not always the case. But, you know, get good at thinking first, like I don't, unless it's your core competency, unless this is the thing you're solving in the world, don't be solving solved problems, find somebody who solved it before and learn what they did doesn't always even mean you have to hire them just how did you do this? Yeah, and people are a lot more giving with their time than perhaps we would assume. Everybody likes to be an expert. I mean, if you lead with like, I just want to understand how you did this, people will tell you. Yeah, and gatherings like this are a great place to tap into that over some great food and uh, complimentary beer. So I mentioned empathy there, and we pulled this title, Empathetic Leadership, from um, an article that you did with the Scotsman. So I'm fascinated to know what empathy means to you socially and in the business context? Why do you think it's so important for modern leadership? Part of it is um, our business model 
is around connecting people with end users, often who are not like them, so they can understand how those people use their product, how they interact with them, what they're thinking about. And ultimately, that's, that's empathy. That's your developer team thinking about how somebody who doesn't have a master's degree in computer science might go through this flow, right? That's, that's not an analytics problem. It's an empathy problem, right? Can I put myself in this person's shoes and sort of walk through this experience? And so I think part of our advantage as a company is we start off with that's the thing that we do with our customers. But it sort of became a big part of our culture. And I think that was really important when we got to the very start of the COVID period and we started really thinking about everybody was going through something quite different. Some people had kids they were taking care of. Some people had parents they were taking care of. Some people were single and lonely living in their apartment. But everybody had a different set of problems. And my leadership team and I spent time talking about there's no one fix. Like there's no simple like corporate program that solves what everybody's going through. And so we spent a bunch of time thinking about how do we create a work environment where everybody at user testing can do the best work of their life while they're here. And it's probably not super prescriptive. It probably involves a little bit more listening. It probably involves some flexibility. It probably involves sort of helping evolve our culture where everyone's doing that, understanding that the person you're working with, you know, has other things they're going through. And we actually found that to be really productive. Uh, productivity levels for us actually went, went up when we started giving people more flexibility and we started listening to people like, what do they need to be successful? And so I think, you know, that piece was really this idea of um, if you want your company to be successful and your company's largely made up of people, then you're really trying to make those people successful. And I don't really think most people are successful at work, but failing at home or failing at home and successful at work. They're really trying to manage their lives and the things that they have going on. And so I think we got better at sort of listening and thinking about how do we set up an environment where that was sort of the right way to get things done. I like that. I think one of the the, the benefits, one of the, the legacies, positive legacies of COVID will be that the kind of LinkedIn personas and the nonsense just kind of dissolved. And we started seeing the whole person. That's something I really hope that we can keep. Um, now, let's talk about Scotland for a second. So I want to see your perception of empathy with Scotland, because Scotland is known as a, as a warm country. So we've got a great tech for good scene. We've got a uh, charming and, and, dare I say, beguiling people that host events like this. Um, how do you see empathy, empathy as a way to kind of, not just for internal stakeholders, but how does that help as a, almost like a competitive advantage with your customer demographic as well? I would say, um, one, I do think Scotland has a history of being a great place to have customer-facing organizations and you know, call centers, support teams. Just you know, I think that is true culturally. I was telling a story earlier when I moved here for my MBA. I rented a uh, – my wife, I should say, found an amazing flat uh, and uh, rented it. And the guy who rented the flat to us offered to pick us up at the airport when we arrived. And I thought, like, this is the most <laughs> incredible hospitality I've ever heard of. And like, no, I don't need a ride from the airport. But uh, I've never heard of a landlord offering the airport pickup service before. We don't, we don't do that in the States. Um, so I think, I think there's some truth to that. Um, what I would say is really, to me, the big opportunity for Scotland is what has changed in the last three years is a lot of people are going to decide where they want to live. And then from there, figure out who they want to work with. And the options of who you want to work with are going to be pretty broad compared to where they used to be in the past. Uh, we're seeing this in the U.S. where people are moving out of living in, you know, small downtown apartments in really crowded cities. And like, you know, I think I'll work from Boise by the mountains with high-speed internet and do the same job. And when I think about where in Europe has incredible work-life balance, um, great schools, um, you know, a place where people want to live. I think it was uh, recently in timeout.com, like Edinburgh was the number one city in the world that people said they wanted to live in, and Glasgow was number four. Well, let's be careful, because this incredible. is on YouTube. We need to be careful, because it, it we've pretty got incredible. people here for the fringe. We don't want it to yeah. go too crazy here. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think, like, that's a big opportunity. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a really, really nice place to live. There are friendly people. Um, you have not only technical talent coming out of the universities, you have incredible language skills. It's a very international city. Um, and so, you know, for us, it sort of checked all these boxes of like, where do we want to open an office? And how has the Scottish expansion gone so far? Well, European, but with Scottish as the heart. Well, we hired our first person in mid-2019. Is that right, Bruce? When did we hire you? 2019? April 2019. 
Uh, so it was one, we hired Fergus not long after that in the summer. So Bruce runs uh, kind of our sales and success functions. Fergus runs our, our tech team and, and a lot of the R&D here. And uh, I think we're about 150 here now. Um, that's out of a company of about 800 people. Uh, and it will be, I think it's our second largest office right now. Our largest is in Atlanta. Uh, San Francisco, our headquarters, actually our third largest office. I think there's reasonably good odds this might be our largest office by the end of the year. So nice. I don't know what the bar for success is, but that sure feels pretty good. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. And it's great to have you here. I mean, we often talk about the dream of kind of building something and then getting to Silicon Valley. But, to, you know, we've got Rockstar and Fangio and Skyscanner, the kind of the ones that we hang our hat on. But to have organizations like Trustpilot and yourselves come into this ecosystem and say, hey, you guys have got it going on. It's a massive compliment. Um, I just want to say thank you. Christine. Well, I appreciate that. I, I think part of it is um, you mentioned earlier, like, how do you find all the scale up talent? And I think this is part of the answer to that, which is um, it is great to have an emerging tech ecosystem of startups. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but running a startup is hard and not all of them make it. So that is a tough game, but it is very worthwhile. Um, helping those startups be successful in part is do you have an ecosystem of folks who, who have been through that stage, who have seen that movie before that can help out. And you know, a lot of the work that I've been trying to do with the Scottish government is to sort of say, look, there is this aspect of scale-ups in the US where companies get to 20, 30, 40 million dollars of revenue and they're growing rapidly and they're gonna expand into Europe. The venture capital firms and the PE firms write them very large checks. I mean, the, the last round, last private round we did at user testing was a hundred million dollar round. So like, you know, it's, it's a good amount of money. Uh, and so why not put together a program where as folks get that mid and late stage investment and part of it is to expand to say well if you're going to put those dollars to work why not put them to work in scotland why not come here and land those jobs and i think what that means for the startup ecosystem is you start to get people you know in that stage growing businesses and and being part of teams that are growing i think that just builds a more vibrant ecosystem of people that have been at different stages in the journey and i also think the flip side is there's a lot that companies can learn as they get larger from startups um you know i hire people all the time we're like they you know i've worked at you know, I've worked at SAP and I've worked at IBM. And it's like, well, you're going to learn a lot from the people that have worked at startups about other things of how we get stuff done. So I think that, you know, that, that learnings go both ways. But I think it's an important part of the ecosystem that um, I think Scotland has a pretty unique value proposition. And I'd love to see more of that sort of inward investment, which I think, again, only complements the startup scene. And that transitions nicely to your role as trade envoy for Scottish Development International um, in terms of what can we what can we, we do in terms of a government governance sense in bringing in experts like yourself who have done international deals? How can we help Scottish businesses break into new ecosystems? Could you tell us a bit about that role? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting role. So um, the Scottish government under uh, trade and uh, trade minister McKee set up this idea of having envoys. Uh, representing Scotland around the world in some key areas and some key industries. So I think there's uh, maybe a little less than a dozen of us. Uh, and so uh, they reached out and said, hey, you know, we're looking at having some representation on the West Coast more focused on tech because of this big opportunity I think that uh, the Scottish tech scene has to offer. Uh, they brought two of us on board. I have a, a colleague named Sunil who is more of a early seed, seed stage trying to help Scottish startups get funding. So I'm sure you all want to connect with me and get connected with him, which is also great. Uh, that's what this is all about. Um, and then I'm sort of in the, uh, the opposite mode of sort of driving inward investment into Scotland, sort of trying to take the user testing playbook and scale that out. Um, and we do that on a, you know, on a volunteer basis, but just because we, I think, have a vested interest in, in Scotland being successful and the tech scene here continuing to grow. Uh, and it's been really nice. It, it gives us uh, a chance to work directly with uh, government ministers, government programs, and, and things like that. Yeah, I think it's it's incredible. This this is part of a shift that I've seen in government in recent years, where instead of being very prescriptive and taking that waterfall approach to business support, they're going to the people who have really built things, and people can actually look up to it in a really tangible way and saying, right, speak to these guys. There's no point in us telling you how to how to ride a bike. These guys have built the bikes. Yeah, they're, they're not only connecting us with companies that are um, considering doing the kind of thing that user testing did, but they're also asking us, what would have made this easier for you all? And I think that's just really smart. Go ask the people that have done it. What would have helped you make this decision easier? And then think about bringing those things into the government. So it's been great. So you're very obviously very focused on people and culture. How 
And hopefully this is a problem that the founders in our audience are going to face at some point. But how have you managed that dynamic while scaling the company internationally from a leadership point of view? I think at some point, uh, leadership is a lot more about communications than it is about even decision making. Uh, you quit, get to a point where um, you're hiring people that are fairly senior leaders and you expect them to have expertise in making decisions and you're really just trying to get them aligned but you have to really over communicate. Um, and I, I have found it's simple things. So, you know, we again had sort of a remote culture even before COVID, um, about a third of our workforce before COVID was, was remote, you know, salespeople and your customers and things like that. We had a super flexible work culture before COVID. If you wanted to come into the office, great. If you didn't, that was fine too. Just get your stuff done. Um, that was true even in our office locations. So we'd sort of developed a bit of this communication style uh, and it's lots of things. We, you know, we do the things you'd expect. We do all hands and, and, you know, we use Slack and all that kind of stuff. But we also do little things. I mean, one of the things I do to try to contribute to that culture is every night, uh, sorry, every Sunday night, I write an email to the whole company. And I time box it. I spend less than 20 minutes on it. And I don't go into it with any notes from the week. I just sort of sit down on Sunday night. I take a deep breath. And I'm like, what am I thinking about right now? Like, what's on my mind? What's important to me? And then I write it. And I don't send it off to marketing to be edited. It sometimes has bad spelling in it or grammatical errors. Uh, and it, but it's just honest. I'm just telling the company this is what I'm thinking about. And it takes a little time for them to get used to the cadence of like, this is not a newsletter. This is not everything that happened in the company. If it's not mentioned, it's not a slide. It's just like, this is just something Andy's thinking about. But it's really effective because ultimately everybody in the company every week is hearing a little bit about what's on my mind. And what's on my mind tends to be the things I end up talking about in my staff meetings or in the forecast call or in the product stand up. So, you know, finding ways like that as you grow to communicate more so than just trying to be hands on and involved in everything gets, gets to be really important. And I think that's very hard when you're in the early stages of a startup. When you're in the early stages of a startup, I mean, you do everything and you slowly promote yourself out of every single job in the company to where you're, you know, you're sending emails on Sunday night and having staff meetings and things like that. And, but it's really important. I mean, if we don't do those things, then I've got 800 people going in different directions. So my job isn't to do those 800 people's jobs. It's to make sure we're all sort of pointed in the same direction. And I think that's a skill I think too many leaders embrace too late. Um, and so that's one thing I'd really kind of keep top of mind as your, as your company grows. I want to come back to um, leadership and how things have changed. Um, I just want to say we're kind of halfway through now, so if you have questions, then get them into the slide and we're going to make time for it. I want to talk about the IPO, though, because... Um, okay, well, why don't you just talk about it? Tell, for people that maybe don't know what that means, it is, it is a type of exit in, in some ways. Could you kind of explain what the IPO was for you guys and what it meant for the company? I would say it's an exit in so much as getting married to someone is an exit from dating them. That's the way I would frame that. Uh, when, when you go public, um, it, is a, it is a financing event for the company and things really do change. But it's a good analogy because um, for so many people in a startup, it's like if we could just, if we could be a public company, you know, if we could get to that point, if, you know, we got to stand on the podium at the New York Stock Exchange and ring the bell. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolutely incredible moment. So I don't mean to diminish that in any way. But as soon as the bell stops ringing, it's it's day one of being a public company. And you have to operate at a wholly different level. And and it, you know, you sort of look back to like when you were a private company, and it again, sort of feels like dating. Like, remember when we didn't have to get up every quarter and tell the whole world what we did and how we did it, we're not held to all these standards and all these things that you work so hard to achieve. And so uh, I think we've really tried to embrace the idea that it was an incredible moment in the company's history. It's a really big deal. I think great companies are public companies. I think it's the right way to run a company at scale, but it also is a little bit of like, okay, well now it's day one as a public company and, uh, and you go from there. Um, you do, it is a financing event, you raise capital, um, but I think maybe what maybe not everybody understands is you're not selling your shares on that day. I mean, the employees still have their stock options and our you know, existing investors came along with us on that journey. And, and so there's still investors in the company. Um, it is nice that uh, employees, if they want it now, can sell their shares. They, they can, you know, they can transact if they want. Um, but, you know, it's not a, it's not like being acquired or something where, you know, everybody gets cashed out and you go on a new mission. You're sort of on that same mission, but now with uh, a lot of visibility and, um, and big expectations and you work really hard to sort of put yourself in that spot. And you talked before about, about how as a CEO, you're trying to promote yourself 
out of a job and delegate and empower people with the things you don't need to be getting on with. How how has your role changed over the years through that growth and that scale and then through that IPO, do you think? I would say a couple of things. Um, I mentioned this slightly earlier, but the weirdest thing about being a CEO at any level of scale is what you thought you were going to do on any given day is probably not what you're going to do on that day because everything else that's going on that nobody knows what to do with just sort of keeps rolling uphill until it gets to your desk. And people are like, hey, we hadn't thought about what to do with this. What should we do? And that's sort of a big part of the job. Um, and I enjoy that. You have to like that aspect of the job. Um, and you really, at some point, just you, you can't be in the details of lots of things. And I think that's hard. Again, I like problems. I like to pull them all apart and understand what's going on. And it's a little bit less of that job at some level of scale. Um, and so I think that maybe is the biggest change. But I think for one of the sort of strange things I would say about my career journey, um, where I think I've been fortunate, is I was at this company called Stellant. We were 400 or so people. It was my first product management job. And uh, I didn't really have anybody working for me as a product manager. I was an individual PM, but a you know, pretty big product line. And we got acquired by Oracle. And um, I got a chance to, to do some demos as part of that process when we were showing them the product to people like Larry Ellison and Safra Katz and people like that. They're like, here's how the product works. And I, I must have done a decent job because at the end of that process, they decided I should run a product management team at Oracle. And I you know, got this role, I was in my late 20s, and I had people working for me who were product managers who were, you know, 10 or 15 years senior than me. And so the first job I ever had managing people, I was managing senior people. And I think that's one of the transitions that I've noticed is really hard for people where you go from managing frontline people that are maybe in their, you know, first or second job in their career, and they're, they're really learning how to do the job and learning how to be a professional, and you're sort of helping them go through that, which is a really important career stage for people. And you work really hard to do that as a frontline manager. And then you get promoted to be a manager of managers. And the people that are working for you don't need any of that help. They know how to do their jobs. That's why they're in that role. And I think that's a really hard transition for a lot of people. And I think one of the sort of, you know, to be successful in your career takes a lot of hard work and a lot of luck. There's just That's just the way it is. And if you don't get that luck right away, you just keep working hard until hopefully it shows up. And one of the lucky things for me was getting to manage senior people very early before I managed a lot of more junior people. And I sort of learned to give them space to listen to what they were saying, to take their advice and their guidance and their expertise. And that's really helpful when you're a CEO because you're not the expert in all the functions you're running, right? I mean, you know, John, our CFO, knows a whole lot more about finance than I will ever know. My head of sales knows a whole lot more about sales than I will ever know. My job is still to make decisions in those areas sometimes, but you got to learn to really listen to your senior folks. And so I'd say as you grow in, in your career, whether it's at a startup or whether you decide to go get some experience in a, in a scale up or something like that, um, I think that's one thing where I've seen really successful senior leaders get good at managing through is how to manage experts that are experts in things you're not an expert in. That is an interesting balance, right? You're going to make decisions about their domain sometimes. It may not always be the decision they want you to make, but you got to get aligned with them and you got to sort of respect their expertise in the process. And that's a that's a lot of a CEO's job. I mean, when you're a CEO, you have seven or eight functions working for you, and most people did not come up through all seven or eight of those functions. So interesting in that all of a sudden you're running a sales team and you've never run a sales team before. You're running a finance team and you've never run finance. Not a lot of jobs like that. It's, uh, oh, is that, is that our time? No, it's probably <laughs> a random alarm for the wrong time zone. So. <laughs> um, so I used to work for one of our local partners, AEI Employability, um, and they are an ethical recruitment company. And as part of that, I would often speak to founders who were hiring their first person. They were taking that journey from entrepreneur to employer. And that kind of mindset shift of being a control freak to being like, a, not that you're a control freak, but being a control freak to like a manager and working out how to be a leader rather than a manager, it's, it's a constant part of the CEO journey to be kind of, to let your ego go and do things for the sake of the company rather for the sake of your sanity. And my team are probably smiling because they know that sometimes I can be a bit, bit of a control freak unnecessarily. What, what message would you say to any of the founders out here who are kind of finding those, those hurdles and approaching them, whether it be hiring people or whether it be hiring people who are better than them and then trusting them with running with the ball? Any thoughts on that? I think the hardest part is is hiring. Hiring is hard, and you got to learn your own strengths and weaknesses in, in hiring. Um, mine is I tend to like most people. Like I could I could sit and have a 
cup of coffee. I'm a, I'm a major extrovert. I could have a cup of coffee with just about anybody and be like, well, that was a lovely time. And so I've learned that in-person interviews with me are sort of like, I'm going to leave and go like, well, that was, that was really nice. I like that person. Not super helpful. So I've learned that, yes, I do in-person interviews. Um, I treat those more as selling moments for me. I'm convincing them that they want to be joining user testing in part because I know I'm terrible at reading how that went in terms of, do I like this person? Do I want to spend time with them? Do they know their function? I use a lot of back channel references. I sort of look at more resume than how they were personally. Cause I get along with most people. Not everybody does that. You might be completely the opposite. So learn your own behaviors when you're hiring. Hiring is really hard. And then start to judge if you can't trust that person to do the job, is it that you can't let go or you didn't hire the right person? And that's the other thing. We often don't hire the right person. And so you're gonna have to learn to get good at figuring that out and then making decisions. What do you wanna do about that? Because um, it's tough to work with somebody if you're not able to sort of find that, that um, way of working together. It doesn't have to mean that you wanna go play golf with them or have a beer with them. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. But you'll find over time, do I, um, do I have energy when I'm even going to go meet this person? Am I excited to go talk with them? Do I feel like we're going to work on a problem together? Or is it like, oh my gosh, I'm looking at my two o'clock and uh, these meetings are always hard. Like that's a signal, right? And it might be on you. You might've made the hire. You're going to have to make a choice. Uh, but I just really get good at hiring. That's a, that's a big one. Um, and it's a constant, constant uh, evolving thing, isn't it? In terms of culture and finding talent and, and it's kind of spooling up as you, as you go. And the network. I mean, we talked about how this might not be... Uh, the largest country in the world, so it's a pretty small network. Um, use that when you're hiring, you know. And, I, and when you do this for a while, I mean, I've been in this industry now for, you know, 20 plus years, almost all in B2B software. So, almost anybody who's like a I don't know product manager, a, you know, senior sales manager in B2B software, like I know somebody that they know. Like it's it's it, you know, it doesn't have to be that far apart. Um, and so your network's really important. They're going to work with me if they hear good things about me. I'm going to work with them if I hear good things about them. And I almost lean more on those things now, again, than when I go meet that person for a cup of coffee and whether or not I enjoyed spending 30 minutes with them is different than do I want this person to run a major function in my company? So, you know, those networks are really important. So speaking of major functions, I know we've got some SaaS heads in the, in the audience tonight, so I want to talk about software as a service. Um, could you share your mindset about software as a service and how, how best to understand your SaaS customer to, to serve them? from a kind of sales and marketing perspective? Yeah, you know, there's a really good uh, analysis that um, one of the VCs at Redpoint did recently where he talked about, um, you know, sort of a PLG plus where you have a, you know, a salesperson, they sell, then they go away and you sort of have just a customer success function all the way up into the enterprise where these people are sort of embedded with the teams they're selling with and you're not going to swap them out after the sale. So one is, I think, figuring out who do you want to be your customer facing team in SaaS or is that just your product and what does that look like? Because, you know, you don't make your money in SaaS until the second year, right? Almost every SaaS business has a customer acquisition cost that's, that's more than a buck for the dollar that you're bringing in. And that's fine because you're going to get that dollar over and over again. That's the whole business model. Um, make sure you're getting that dollar over and over again or the business model very quickly starts to, to fall down. And I think that takes some adjustment. You know, as you grow, as you get different kinds of customers, there's no right or wrong answer. I've worked at, you know, even at user testing, we focused on, on gross retention for a little while, which is, again, just the contract value that's up for renewal. How much of that do you get? We've worked on a team where that's been incentivized on net retention, which is not just the renewal, but the upsell that comes with it. Uh, and so we've shifted that model from time to time. And so I'd say just getting really clear on what's your retention strategy early on and who do you want focused on that retention strategy? Getting that right solves most pain points in a SaaS company and getting that wrong will cause incredible pain points in a SaaS company. And so if you're not focused on that, I know, especially early on, you're really focused on how do I get the sales? How do I get the deals? Um, it is really about how do I build an annuity? And the earlier you figure out what that recipe is, the better off you're going to be. I see some nodding in the audience, which is always good, because I didn't understand anything you just said. <laughs> um, what SaaS companies do you look up to apart from user testing and why? Well, I cut my teeth in, in SaaS at Salesforce. Um, and so that's a they built up a pretty pretty good machine and, and know how to do that really well. Um, I think Snowflake right now is, is a pretty uh, compelling company in thinking about um, a model, not a model that we're on, but a model of sort of driving value through consumption of the product, like the actual literal usage of the product is what drives value. Uh, I think that's interesting because ultimately I think 
Uh, there's a high likelihood that SaaS, which is you know software as a service, which ultimately really de-risked the deployment of the software. Um, looking around, I don't know if many of you are old enough to remember, but the software used to come on a CD, and you had to buy servers, and about 50% of the time you screwed up that part and never got to the software running. And SaaS came along and said, like, what if that was just a URL and you logged in and it works? The second part of that problem is getting the outcome you wanted from the software. Does your team know how to log into Salesforce and set up your territories and set up your dashboards and plug it into your billing system and all this other stuff? And so I think more and more we're going to start to see sort of outcome as a service, right? If you're running a B2B software company, your goal is not to be the best deployment of your Salesforce automation platform. Your goal is to be the best in having your product be sold and you want your Salesforce automation to just sort of work. And so I think the next generation of SaaS products are really going to think about how do you make sure that the ultimate end goal happens? And I don't know if that'll be using more machine learning. I mean, we've been working on our product to surface more insights that come right out of the product. So you don't have to do all that legwork yourself. Um, and I think it might have business models that sort of reflect, you know, paying on those outcomes versus simply paying to use the software. Because I know being in Salesforce, there were plenty of bad Salesforce deployments. Like they were paying us to have the software, but they might not have been as successful as they could have been. And so, you know, I think the next sort of turn of the crank in business software is going to be, I don't want to buy the software, I want to buy the outcome. And I'm fine if the software is part of it, but what I really want is the problem I'm buying the software for to be solved. And I want the expertise and the know-how and the best practices to sort of all be part of it. That kind of ties into the, the instant gratification play that all companies are now seeing. I mean, we're so used to just having things on demand that will happily compromise data and privacy just to get the thing that we want quickly. Uh, seamless transition into ticking boxes and, and serving people, right? And things move really quickly. And so, you know, if you're a business leader and you discover you have a challenge, most people are not interested in a six to nine month project to solve that challenge. And so if I've got my choice between two vendors and one of them will sell me some software, introduce me to somebody who might help me implement it and tell me to be live in nine months and somebody else says, yeah, we have a tool that plugs into the thing that you're using and solves the problem. I'm going to pay a lot more for the second thing um, than I am the first thing. And so, you know, really thinking about problems you're solving versus software you're building, I think is an important mindset. And there's probably a lot of companies here that are solving those problems that would happily be acquired and be middleware of bigger companies rather than be the next Salesforce themselves. You know, I think that's something that I would say you set out to solve problems and along the way you'll figure those things out. If you build a company with the goal of selling it to someone, my experience is those companies almost never end up getting bought. If you build a company thinking about how to solve a problem for a customer, and that problem might you know, exist in someone else's ecosystem, then that gets really interesting. They go, oh, look, there's this you know, vendor out there I could partner with, this other software company. They solve this problem that my customers have. You learn about that, and you go, oh, that's interesting, and then you buy that company. Um, I, I, you know, the, the history of Silicon Valley is, is sort of littered with companies who you know, they made one bet. They're like, we're going to get bought by these people. And then something happens, and that doesn't happen, and then you're in a really tough spot. I was at Salesforce when um, we I won't I won't name the names, but we we bought a company. That company six months earlier had bought a different company. Okay, so the people at this other company had been acquired twice in six months. It was sort of like the picture of like a fish swallowing a fish swallowing a bigger fish, right? Um, and that sort of accidental acquisition by Salesforce of the derivative company had a partner ecosystem in Salesforce that was massive of people solving that problem. And we just sort of showed up one day and we're like, oh, we have one of those now, thanks, we're all set. There was no strategic plan there for us to go get into that space. We just sort of ended up with one. And so, you know, when you think about building a business, if that company's whole strategy, some other company was just to solve that problem only for Salesforce, that's a, that's a tough position to put yourself in. But if you want to say, hey, we're gonna solve this problem for a bunch of customers, some of them use Salesforce, some of them use this other stuff, then you've got a lot of flexibility because things will change. Um, you know, Mark Benioff at Salesforce used to say all the time, you know, sometimes your tactics dictate your strategy. Things will change. You will have to make near-term decisions all the time that implicate your long-term strategy. So you can't say, I can't make this near-term decision. I have this long-term strategy to be acquired by this company. Like, it doesn't work that way, right? Solve a real problem. Be flexible in how you think about solving it. Be adaptable while you go down the road figure out where you got product market fit, follow that product market fit. If you do all those things and you solve a real problem, there will be people that are interested in your company and then you're gonna have options. You're gonna decide, do I wanna sell this thing or not? There were multiple places along the way where the founder could have sold user testing. 
But along the way, product market fit kept increasing. There were new opportunities on the horizon. There were ways internally to do things better. And he got to make choices. I think at this point, he's probably relatively happy with the choices he made along the way. Um, if you don't have choices, that's when you get boxed in. My dad used to say all the time, he worked really hard not to have outcomes, but to have options. And so think about that when you're building your company. Build a company that has options. I would say that answer is probably worth the ticket price alone. Is that You want to give a round of applause for that answer? Go ahead. <laughs> um, Anna, how are we doing for audience questions? Um, we had 12 last time I checked. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> wrap this baby up. So, Andy, flipping empathetic leadership to reflective self-compassion. Yes, I am that guy. What piece of advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? This is like a classic uh, fireside chat question, so sorry. Um, I would say I don't think I had any idea how important my network would be at that age. Um, in fact, there are a couple of people not too long after I was 20, when I went to Stelland, uh, so I was 24, um, that worked with me today at user testing. Wow. Um, and have sort of been with me along the way. My CMO, we've worked together at five different companies. My COO, we've worked together at six different companies. And uh, they're incredible leaders, and, and I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, but I think much earlier on, I would have loved to have just really understood that if you, if you do this for a while, it is a small world. You are going to be you know, at conferences, at events, you're going to meet a customer. Somebody's going to walk in the room and be like, oh, I've met you before. I know you. And I remember being in my, in my 20s and my, my boss's boss was an you know, amazing extroverted COO. And he used to walk into these meetings with our industry analysts and they would spend 10 minutes talking about people I'd never heard of about who had moved where and what had happened. And I was sort of like, how do these people? And then you, you sort of grow into the role and you realize your space, your industry, the problem you're solving, the kind of area you're in, it's just not that big of a world. So I, I really would have love to have coached myself a little bit more of like just how valuable it is um, because it, it is a big part of not only the opportunities you'll have, but frankly, sort of the enjoyment you'll have in what you do. Um, I think maybe one of the best parts about being a CEO is ultimately like, I get to pick who I work with. That's an amazing privilege, right? I mean, I, I will, in this job at least, never have a boss I don't like. I don't have to have a peer I don't want to work with. I don't have a direct report that I don't think treats me well or doesn't treat their employees well. Like I get to make all those choices. You won't get to make those choices early in your career. You can decide if you want to tolerate that situation. You can, you can exit that situation if you don't like it. But as you build your network and you, and you move on in your career, ultimately you want to have the ability to work with people you're going to enjoy working with. And the network, for me in a lot of ways, has been the most fulfilling part of my career. It's like having these people I just genuinely enjoy working with. You can solve really hard problems if you like the people you work with. So start early on that. Decide who you want to work with. And you start a business, you get to pick those things. So don't just pick somebody because you like their reputation or pick somebody because you heard they did something great. Like work with people who are amazing at what they do. Like don't compromise on that. But but ultimately over time, find people that are amazing at what they do that you really like working with. Otherwise, you know, go take a job somewhere else. Why start your own company if you're going to work with people you don't like working with? Amen. Um, before I pass over to Anna then, have you got any final thoughts to the business leaders and the hungry SaaS enthusiasts in the room tonight on, uh, from your journey? I, I would say the only um, maybe topic that we talked about in San Francisco that we got a lot of feedback uh, afterwards uh, you know, when, when folks were chatting with me that they, they thought was interesting, I'll relay again, which was um, I think especially in Silicon Valley, and it sort of now spreads around the world, there's a tremendous overemphasis in raising a lot of capital at really high valuations. And I would say that only really works well if you have an absolutely incredible outcome. And the story that a lot of folks don't tell is all the companies that did reasonably well, but because they raised money at such high valuations with such high expectations, you end up with this you know, cap table sitting in front of you where you might not have choices, you might have to raise around, you might have to sell the company, and so I think venture capital is one of the most game-changing things in the world. I think it's one of the things that the U.S. has really got right, that we have all these amazingly well-funded, innovative, great ideas that don't all have to work out, that there's a business model behind VC Works. But I tell founders all the time, be thoughtful about the money you take, be thoughtful about who you take it from, be thoughtful about the structure that it comes with. If you are successful, there will come a point in time where how you did that will really matter to you and what your choices are, and the people that you brought into the business. So there's no right or wrong answer, but it's not the headline and the most money. 
it is one of the things that I think I did not appreciate early in my career, that how you finance what you're doing matters a lot. And I hear founders say all the time, doesn't matter, it's just money, I took the most money from whoever would hand it to me. And again, maybe that's your only option, but if it's not, Take money from people you trust, take money from people you want to work with, take money on reasonable terms, both for you and them, and then build something great and you'll have options. It kind of ties into what you're just saying about not having to work with people that you don't like. If When you take money from people, you're in bed with them for a while. So be really careful about that. And they're going to have a big say in what you do and a big say in what your options are. So work with the right people. But also, again, think of raising money. Like it, it should feel like a fair transaction. Like If you're raising money, you're like, this is a crazy multiple. I can't believe anybody would give me money at this rate. It's like, well, but you have to now earn your way into that multiple right? to have your, especially your employees, which if you do this right, you're going to care a lot about this, to have your employees be in a position where their equity in the company is going to be valued. So every time I see somebody raise money at a valuation where I'm sort of like, I can't believe they took that money at that term. They were probably telling themselves, I can't believe somebody's giving money at these terms. And they're going to learn later on, yeah, this was, this was not the best environment. So you know, I'd say in everything you do, but especially in raising money, think about you know, it should feel like the right amount of capital for the right outcome for the stage that you're at. And I'd rather have you look back and say, oh, maybe I could have diluted a little bit less if I'd taken this outrageous thing. However, you know, everybody's in the black. Everybody's ahead of where the funding needs to be. Everybody's in a good spot, and you got lots of options. And so, you know, user testing, we raised, as I said, we raised, you know, $100 million in our last round, but I'd say we raised it at a fairly conservative valuation so that we knew we would have options. You know, do we want to take the company public if a strategic interest had come in that we had liked, if we wanted to raise more capital, you know, all those options were in front of us. And so, you know, your funding in some ways will be your future. Think about that when you take capital. Um, I, I know Anna's chomping at the bit, but I just want to go on a little mini rant about uh, funding in Scotland because it's, it's, some people might say, oh, that's all very well for you to say because in Silicon Valley, there's lots of money and there's lots of VCs. In Scotland, we don't have as mature of a VC culture and a lot of Scottish companies think that they have to kind of graduate Scotland, go to London, go to Europe, go to Silicon Valley to make those raises. And because there's that lack of opportunity to be in front of VCs, there's a some, somewhat of a mindset of putting the VCs on a pedestal. And actually the reality is that these people are part of the ecosystem. There are people who are managing, this is my opinion, yeah. tell me what you think about this. There are people that are managing other people's money and they actually need a healthy funnel of startups at the top so they can do their jobs. And when you realize that they are just people that are doing a job as well, it kind of takes the fear and intimidation out of the VC game a bit. What do you think of that? I, I think that's right. I would just keep in mind, um, they are company builders. I mean, a lot of these VCs are, are amazing. So I, I'm not, you know, belittling their focus or what they're doing, but you know, either you're in a position where they're, you know, you've got options and you can pick which one of these VCs you want to work with, or maybe you're picking a local VC that's not going to give you Silicon Valley terms, but there's somebody you want to work with. And again, if they're fair terms and you're going to build the business together, great. You know, I'd, I'd rather see people take money from a, a smaller VC with fair terms than from a big name VC with, with hard terms, right. Or with a big preference stack. So, you know, just, be thoughtful about whoever you raise from, um, how you raise, and what you're thinking about. And if any of you have, um, again, this is kind of stuff I'm happy to to help with. I'm, I'm not going to like do your round with you, but if you want to send me like, hey, I'm thinking about this problem. I've got these couple options. You know, this is the kind of thing that if you say, oh, I didn't want to ask some people. You know, I don't want to talk about you know money or funding or whatever. Have people see what our confidential raise might be, and then you sign that dotted line. This is your funding now. Like this is your cap table. These are the people you're doing business with. And so, you know, if you if you don't know the answer or you're not sure how this works, like find someone who does to give you some advice on what to do. It. it I've met so many founders, especially frankly, founders who are on a, like a technical mission. There's, you know, like I'm solving this problem. I'm really interested in this, and I'm just not interested in who gives me the money or how. Um, you either either your startup doesn't make it, and that didn't matter, or at some point it's going to matter a lot. So if this isn't something that's really interesting to you. Doesn't have to mean you got to hire a CFO right away, but find somebody in your network. Find somebody who just would be willing to help you understand what you're signing into and what your options will be and what it means to look like to get to a certain point in time because it 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 is really important. And I don't think that it's something that's talked about enough. We we love to talk about what people raised, but we don't talk about how they raised it or why they made that decision or why they took this amount or that amount. 
we just talk about, oh my gosh, look at this giant pile of cash that these folks got. Um, and so, you know, just, just learn, learn the details. I love that. Okay, you've heard enough from me. It's time for me to hand over to you guys via uh, Anna Brow. Um, but before we do, can we just get a round of applause for, for Andy? Absolute gold dust here tonight. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Nick. And thank you so much, Andy, for that fantastic conversation. I love how you keep bringing it back to the people. You know, it's the people who are around you. And I think, you know, from someone who's more at the early stage of their career, um, you know, I definitely, that re really resonates with me as well. And and I know we've just been talking about your raising. Um, and I have a few questions in the slider tonight that kind of pitch on that. So um, I think I'm going to combine a couple. So the first one we have is really around um, what what did you do to prepare your team for growth and prepare them for that change of pace? And the other one, which I think might have um, some connection as well, was what was the biggest growth hurdle um, or scaling challenge that you faced as the CEO? So um, every situation is different. The one I walked into in user testing was uh, really strong product market fit, but we had sort of built everything in a unique way internally. And so we didn't have a, a really detailed demand gen funnel. We didn't have a full-time CMO when I joined, which is sort of interesting at a 45 million ARR SaaS company. Most of them have CMOs. Um, we didn't have a lot of segmentation in our sales team. So there's a lot of sort of execution, like just how do we get lined up to grow? We, we had a bunch of constraints. You know, we didn't have enough Salespeople, we weren't managing the leads the right way. We, we sort of had weird concepts of how leads were distributed. And so it was a lot of just sort of spending time to learn a little bit about why it worked and then sort of apply like, okay, well, if we were going to have this go faster, what needs to be different? And then the way we got aligned to the first part of your question is, um, you know, I, I had an offsite with the management team, uh, which was pretty interesting. We didn't have much of an offsite culture previously. And we got together, we brought um, about 35 people. So we were a company about 225 then. So maybe, you know, most senior 10% of the company. And we just sort of went around the room and talked about what problems people were working on. And at the time, a lot of people didn't have a lot of visibility into what everybody else was, was sort of trying to get done. We spent some time on that. And then we sat down and said, okay, at the time we were growing about 20%. We said, what do we have to do to have this business grow 30%? And in that room together, we sort of said, what constraints have to change? What would we have to believe to invest more money into our growth engine? And we came up with three or four things, and it was really around building a, a marketing funnel. Um, it was around sort of changing the way we worked with our largest customers versus everybody else. Uh, we had these really big customers, and, and they were growing like crazy. And so you look at the salespeople, and it's like, well, you know, uh, this woman on our team has, you know, all these amazing tech companies in her territory, but she also has our largest customer in her territory and she's spending all her time at our largest customer and we're doing great there. So it's sort of hard to be mad at her, but it's like, we got to change that. We got to reorganize like what the constraint is there. And so we came up with a list and then we just committed to making those changes and we put in some checkpoints along the way. If this happens, then this, if this happens, then this. And then, you know, we sort of put the funding behind it at that point. Brilliant, thank you. And I love this question. What is one thing that you still want to learn or get better at? That's a really good question. Um, we're already public, so running a public company sounds like a scary answer, but I think that's the case. It, it is, uh, it's different. You, you get measured on different metrics. Um, there's a very different cadence. I'm learning a lot of our, of our analysts um, that, that you know, cover our stock, um, dealing with public company investors. It's a really different part of the job, and um, I've really enjoyed it. It's it's fun to get to really work on a whole different surface area than what you've been working on previously. And so um, we're what three three quarters now into being a public company. So I'm sure there's plenty of room for growth there. So I think that would be my answer: like learning to be a public company CEO and sort of the finance side of that, how we communicate to Wall Street and things like that. I think that's a big big area. Who do you learn that from? Well, the cool part about public companies is it's public. So I get to listen to earnings calls and, and hear what other CEOs do uh, and things like that. And so um, that's largely been my approach. And it's interesting. They all have very different styles. Um, and one of the things I also tell folks about leadership is when you pick really iconic 
people to try to emulate or follow, it's, it's often hard because what works for them often doesn't work for everybody else. Like, you know, do you remember when the Steve Jobs book came out and everybody went around treating each other kind of terribly for like three months because you read it in the Steve Jobs book and then you meet people that work for Steve Jobs and they're like, most amazing experience in my career. And you just sort of realize like, what works for Steve Jobs doesn't necessarily work for all of us. Like there's a certain level of sort of genius and style there, right? Um, we would tell people that when you worked at Salesforce, like you, you can't have a company of 20,000 people all trying to be Mark Benioff. He's a pretty amazing and unique individual and his style works for him. And so I listen to these earnings calls and, and I, I like to listen to Mark's earnings calls, but I tend to listen to, um, you know, some of the more, uh, replaced a founder, came into a business, you know, um, like I think the, you know, uh, Coupa is a good example, like, the, you know, interesting earning calls, um, folks like that. And so I get to listen to, to, like, how they do it and how they talk about it. Brilliant. Thank you. And I also love this question um, from Dick from the Startup Grind team, actually. Um, but with your empathy hat on, how have you approached the current market downturn? Well, we've had to make changes. I mean, we talked about we had an earnings call today, and we talked about the fact that we had to make some changes to the size of our team, which is really hard. Um, you know, part of being a leader is making hard decisions when you have to make them. Um, I've worked for people before that just don't make the hard decision, and you feel like, oh, they're doing this because they're a wonderful person, but everybody is struggling behind that decision not being made. And so, um, I'm positive in your career, you'll you'll have hard choices that still have to be made with empathy. And so we thought about how we made those choices. We thought about how we communicated with the team. Um, it was really important to me that we, you know, treated folks well, that we had, you know, private individual conversations with them and things like that. So, you know, you can live your values while you do hard and difficult things. And I think as you go through your career and you become a senior leader, you realize like the problems don't get easier. I know it's really fun on TV to talk about, you know, billionaire CEOs, which I am not, uh, and, and how wonderful their lives are and things like that. But, you know, for, for running, you know, parts of companies, for being leaders, you know, people look to you to make hard decisions and the challenging problems do come to you. And so you can sort of take those challenges and think about how it impacts all the people in the decision you're making. And a lot of those decisions won't be positive. I've had to make really hard decisions, even on individual employees. I mean, we had a, um, we had a circumstance not at user testing at a, a previous place I worked where uh, someone clearly with a drug problem went into one of our restrooms and left drug paraphernalia in the bathroom. And someone came to me and said, hey, I was in there right after this person and, you know, like they have a problem. And now you're in this position like you, you have to let this person go at this point. Like you can't you can't allow that to happen in your workplace. But then you're also trying to find this person help that they need. And like those are hard choices. And and. You know, they're straightforward choices in some way. Like there are two things that have to happen right here. And one is like, this person's not coming to work tomorrow in our office. Uh, by the way, this wasn't like a loose joint or something. This was like serious, serious stuff. They had a real problem. And the second was trying to figure out how do we encourage this person to go get help knowing that the company is not in the substance abuse business. Like we're, we're, not, a, we're not a legal party here. We can't make this person do something. And so you know, you will find yourself, whether you expect it or not, it'll be on days you don't expect it to be put in situations where, you know, you have to make hard choices. And so sometimes you don't get to decide what the choice needs to be, but you can then decide how do you want to do it. And so, you know, in that situation, we, we thought about how to help this person as best we could. Um, you know, we could, we could have, you know, could have called the cops right away. We could have made sure he went to prison. I mean, there were lots of choices in front of us. And we thought about what do we do to get this person some help? But we also had to you know, I don't think losing their job was going to be the next big thing to make them successful in life, right? And so you will have hard choices. People will judge you both on whether you make them, and it's not about not making them. You'll have to make them, and then they'll judge you on how do you make them? How do you think about doing those things? That got deep. Everybody all right? <laughs> Quite deep. Um, well, thank you for that very honest answer. Um, changing the mood a little bit. Yes, please. <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, we do not have time to go through all the questions tonight, um, but I wanted to end on this question, um, which I see pop up quite often, and I really love this question, which is what makes you most excited about the future for user testing? So um, I think what I find uh, interesting is always the surface area of the problem. Uh, and, and what can that look like over time? And what I like about user testing is, number one, I think it solves a very core need we have in technology, 
I think we all feel like sometimes the things that we're using, the technology, it's like nobody thinks there's a person on the other end of this sometimes, right? I, I sort of use the analogy, it's a little bit like when you're driving in traffic and you watch how people treat each other, they wouldn't treat each other like that if they were standing in line at the bank next to each other. It's only the, the separation of being in these two separate cars where people are kind of the worst versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that happens online a lot. I think people can be the worst versions of themselves online. They're not dealing with real people. And I think uh, our mission is to sort of bring uh, empathy into a lot of how technology works. And so I think that core mission is interesting and important. And then I think it's interesting to think about how do we how do we then take that into all these different areas? There's sort of this you know, opportunity of like, how do we help everything from product teams to marketing teams to HR teams to get you know, diverse perspectives and understand and have empathy for people. And so I think that's, that's a really sort of big and fun area that if we can get right, I think is important because tech's not going away. I mean, more and more of our lives are gonna get consumed by tech. So if we can make that a little bit more human, a little bit more empathetic, like that, that feels like a worthwhile mission bringing the humanity back to tech. Yes. Love that, I love that. Um, so thank you so much, Andy. Um, a round of applause, what a fantastic, fantastic yeah, thank time. you. Thank you so much, thank you. Brilliant. And just a few thank yous from me before um, I let you all go. Um, firstly, to our sponsors, CMS and Firstport, and of course, to our fantastic host, User Testing. Um, also, thank you to Emily for providing the food this evening. There's still some more food here if anybody has missed out. Um, and finally, to our audience, um, you know, you're the heart of our community. Um, so thank you so much for your endless support and, of, of course, your great chat. Um, if you're looking for some more Startup Grind um, events, our next event is on August the 18th in Glasgow, where our fantastic Glasgow chapter um, director, Emma, will be hosting Andrew Dobby, the founder and CEO of Made Brave. So have a chat with Emma if you want to hear about the details. She's just here in the front row. She's not going to put it. There she is. <laughs> um, and finally, we're going to be hanging out here until about 8.45 um, before we head over to One Square at the Sheraton. So please enjoy the food, the drink, and the company until then. Um, and finally, one, yeah, one last round of applause for Andy. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.